Well, good evening. I appreciate Pastor Stewart inviting me here to, to speak once again. This is like the fourth summer that when he takes vacation, he's asked me to come and take these evening sessions, I believe, and I always look forward to it. This is truly a church that is a home away from home just because of how you always welcome me and my family, so I appreciate it. When Pastor Stewart uh, asked me to come, I normally will ask him to assign me something because he will assign me something that I would have never chosen and it turns out to be a challenge and edifying for me. But he told me to pick a theme and so there was no question. I chose the doctrine of Scripture. Now, this is a doctrine that is under attack today. Over the next four weeks, we are going to be exploring what the Bible has to say about Scripture, and the timing is appropriate. Coming in October 2017 will mark the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, in which we get the phrase that is true for all evangelical churches is Scripture alone. And that is what we're going to be focusing on, is the doctrine of Scripture alone. And the reason we say Scripture alone, and the word alone is so important, is because we derive our authority in our personal life and in the corporate body of the church from Scripture alone. This is a doctrine that has been under attack. Now, you've seen it. Truth is absent in our society today, in a relativistic postmodern society that doesn't view truth as being important anymore. We see that truth itself is under attack. But this is nothing new. This has been the truth since the very beginning. And so I would invite you to join me by turning in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. Now, what is ironic about this chapter is this chapter is probably the most important chapter in all of the Bible. And as we read this chapter, there's something you have to know that I believe. This is history. This is an event that took place. What we are reading are the words of God recording an actual event that took place in time. Without this chapter, you have no explanation for pain, for suffering. Apart from this chapter, you have no way to philosophically, scientifically reason from natural resources why we suffer, why there's war, why there's pain, why there's sin, why there's death. Apart from Genesis 3, there's no explanation for it. And so what makes it so ironic that Genesis 3 is where we find the answer is Genesis 3 is one of the most attacked chapters in all of the Scripture. It's one of the most attacked stories in all of Scripture, save the resurrection and the virgin birth of Christ. We hear the words, did God really say and that is the question of the ages. Where we have our answers is the very focal point of Satan's attack. To get you and the world to doubt God's word. And we see it from the very beginning. It says in verse 1 of Genesis 3, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? As you read this verse, or hear it being read, the first question that should be popping into our mind in light of this verse is, who is this talking serpent? It's not a myth. This is not an ancient Near Eastern story that has been adopted by Jews and then Christians alike. There was actually a serpent, more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made, that says to the woman, in actual time, did God actually say? But who is this talking serpent? And just for briefly, pretend like you don't know, because I know you know the answer. Genesis itself does not identify the serpent for us. 
other than he was created. And that there's something very different about him. In fact, the beginning of the verse grasps our attention. Now, it's to say that there's something different about this serpent. But we do see this, is that he's not an autonomous, self-created, self-sustained, independent of God being. But he's fully dependent because he was created. We also see in the text that he's described as more crafty. And that he talked to Eve. And now if we just had the book of Genesis, we would have no clue as to the identity of the serpent in a concrete way. It's in further revelation that we see it in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. We learn the serpent's true identity is none other than the devil himself. I see two biblical options for understanding this serpent and the identity of the serpent, and, and, and either one could be correct. Either Satan took the form of a serpent, as 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4, 14, describes him as a master of disguise. And perhaps he takes the form of a serpent because he is a master of disguise. Or the other option is Satan possessed the body of this creature, we see that taking place with animals in Mark chapter 5, a herd of pigs to be exact. But whatever the means that Satan appears here, it's clear that this is Satan. He spoke with great intelligence. He speaks with shrewdness. And he is opposed to God. And he is deceptively desiring to destroy and murder. Isn't it fitting that he appears as a snake? Snakes by nature do not announce themselves. They're subtle creatures. In fact, you don't know you're upon one until you're almost upon one. But he, as this serpent, is described as more crafty than any of the other beasts of the field. This is an obvious contrast to Adam and Eve. Chapter 2, verse 25, it says, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This is speaking of their moral, their ethical innocence. They stood in front of one another with no shame. There was no guilt. And then you see this innocent couple right after that. You see this cunning serpent that's speaking. It's an obvious contrast that we're supposed to note between the serpent and Adam and Eve. And the idea of craftiness... This is clearly an attribute of Satan. This is not just a general description of serpents or snakes in general. This is of Satan. An attribute of Satan is that of craftiness or cunning, whatever your English translation has there. And this word is very interesting because it's used both negatively and positively in Scripture. In other words, it could be good to be cunning. It could also be very bad. The context determines it. It's really what cunning is, is, is skill. It's wisdom. It, it can even be skill and wisdom in working with one's hands. But because the context teaches us this is a negative usage of the word cunning, we need to understand that what lies behind the word is what defines it. It is to use one's resources of skill and wisdom for evil intent, for evil purposes, for some nefarious goal and end result that will result in some sort of evil purpose of the one who possesses the craftiness. And because it's skillfully held, the intent of the cunning one will not be obvious. What is his intent? Satan's purpose, his intent, is to cause doubt in Eve. It is to get her to question God's goodness within her. That's Satan's intention for you. Doubt in God's goodness. Satan's intention is to murder her. To take her life. To embarrass God and bring glory to himself. May we never forget this when temptation stands before us, disguised as an angel of light. The intention is not for good, it is for harm. And because he is crafty, because he is highly intelligent, it should not be ignored. 
Satan's more dangerous today than he was in the garden. Spurgeon makes this observation by saying that Satan today is more cunning than he was in the days of Adam, for he has had long dealings with the human race. He has explored every outwork of our nature, end quote. He's observed for about 6,000 years human nature, watching people. Let us be reminded as Christians, those in, that are in Christ, for he who is greater in you is greater than he who is in the world. Let us also be reminded that Satan is not an autonomous creature. He doesn't have uh, omnipotence. He only has that which of God allows him. If you're starting here in Genesis 1 and reading through Genesis 2 and you get to Genesis 3, there's two things that should be shocking to you. One is that there's a snake in rebellion against God in the first place. The second thing is, is that Adam and Eve had dominion over all of the animals of, of the field. How is it that there's a beast of the field demonstrating greater wisdom than Eve? The first thing is this, is why is there a snake in rebellion against God? Where did he come from? Because God had declared everything very good on the sixth day. But yet we see this serpent and this seems very bad. Somewhere between the completion of creation and chapter 3, something happens. And we're not told in Genesis what's happened. We know this is that it's Satan has rebelled, but we're never told this in Genesis. It's only in later parts of the Bible that we begin to fit together the pieces. In fact, if you look at Ezekiel 28, verses 11 through 19, it describes the king of Tyre, but it also is describing Satan, the serpent. And you get to verse 15, and it says this most interesting verse in verse 15 is that he was created blameless until iniquity was found in. Key word is the word in. However sin came to be is never explained. Not here. But where sin originated is clear. It was in the serpent. In Satan. Satan himself was created blameless, as was Adam and Eve. Yet he rebelled against God. But he is created. He's not all-powerful. He's not all wise. He is limited. You might ask the question, why did God not immediately destroy Satan? And the third of heaven, the fallen demons that went with him, it's never explained, but somehow we know this. It has to fit into God's plan. He wasn't taken by surprise. It fits in his plan to show grace, to show mercy, to offer salvation, to provide salvation for his people. And trying to answer that question, why God didn't do something, well, it's never safe to go beyond what we're given, is it? Second shocking thing here is that this beast of the field is pictured wiser than Eve. And why is this shocking? Because Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. They were image bearers. And God gave them, both Adam and Eve, dominion over the beasts of the field. He gave them dominion. He made them king and queen of all the earth and had them keep the garden. They had dominion. In a very limited scope, they understood what sovereignty meant over something. And Eve had to have known this intimately because she was there with Adam. Assign this role. But guess what she does? Eve abandons her role of having dominion. She abandons her role as Adam's helper. She abandons the word of God by being led to rebellion by one of her servants. And that's the shocking thing. She's to have dominion over this. But yet it's this serpent that she has dominion over that leads her into rebellion against her creator. God's design in nature is clearly seen in roles. And a reversal of roles will have catastrophic results. A reversal of roles in the church will have catastrophic results for the church. A reversal of roles in the home will have catastrophic results in the home. And we, right now in 2017, are living in the midst of it in this country. 
Because we've abandoned roles that God has assigned. God's design, God's plan, God's word is not in submission to us, but we are to be in submission to it. But we've reversed the roles. Let us be warned by Eve's tragic mistake, for her error was a rejection of the creator-creature distinction. In other words, God created, you were created. She was created, you were created, I am created. Everything was created. There's not some rebel molecule out there on its own, self-sustaining, apart from God. God created, never forget that, for it is by Him, by His perfect design and plan, that sets our roles and our place. And what's amazing about the book of Genesis is that it pictures God as, yes, a physical creator, but also the designer of the very nature of all that He created. And His Word teaches us this. Let us not reject that, what God has designed and put in place, even when it's unpopular. Now let's consider Satan's tactic here. He's going to attack God's character by attacking his words. Make no mistake, he's attacking God, but he's attacking God by attacking God's word. Attacking God's word is attacking God in an indirect form, and that's Satan's tactic. Look what he says. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of the, any tree in the garden? It's a question of incredulous surprise. Really, God said that to you? It's meant to cause doubt. It's meant to bring up a question in your mind. It's to make you suspicious. And guess what? It's very effective, isn't it? Someone said that to you? Really? They said that? What do you think? You begin to question what was said. Notice the question does not accurately represent God's word. Go figure. He says, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden. That's not what God said. God said, you shall surely eat of every tree of the garden. You see, when Satan attacks God's word, he's going to give his lying, deceitful, egregious interpretation. He's not going to accurately represent God. He's not going to represent God's word correctly. And now if you connect that with the descriptive that he's cunning, it becomes very dangerous. His interpretation is intended to kill, and it's based upon a murderous lie. Look what Jesus says about him. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. Notice what a gross exaggeration of the prohibition. There was a prohibition in the garden. But he exaggerates that. He was trying to get Eve to see the absurdity in God's word. What do I mean by that? Well, God doesn't need fruit to eat. Why doesn't he allow you to eat without exception? Why doesn't God just allow you to do whatever you want? He doesn't need to eat of the tree. Why can't you eat of it? God wants to keep you down. He wants to withhold something from you. Good. You should be able to eat whatever you want, Eve, anytime you want, whenever you want. It's the same lie today, isn't it? It's your body. Do with it whatever you want. It's my life. I'll do with it whatever I want. Who's to tell me what to do? That's the lie. That's a lie from Satan. He's undermining God's authority by questioning God. This question is meant to lead Eve to agree. Why, why would he prohibit anything from me? His prohibition must not have any authority over me because it's a silly prohibition in the first place. I should be able to eat whatever I want. It's simple. If you Listen, if you treat the Bible in a like manner, you in essence are saying, I know more than God. I'm superior to God's knowledge. This is all from one question, folks. The question, did God really say? You notice that Satan's attack is not a direct attack on God. It is indirect. 
He doesn't come right out and say what his intentions are because he's crafty. How often does temptation come our way through indirect forms and means and often through trusted people? Satan's point of attack is where you are least fortified. And the most dangerous attacks that we face are not from enemies that announce themselves with brute force and loud clamoring noises, but they come from a seductive enticement to disobey the very word of God. Not a flagrant attack, but with a deceitful question disguised in innocence of this. Did God really say? Question of the ages, isn't it? It implies that God withheld something by way of prohibition. Yet following this story in the book of Genesis, you see it's clear that God withheld nothing from them. He gave them his image. He created them in his image. He gave them dominion. He gave them this bountiful garden and said, eat everything in it. It's all for you. Just don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So this question, did God really say is ultimately an attack on God's very character. How is it that you view God's word? Is it burdensome? Is it restrictive? Or are you like the psalmist in which it is to be desired more than fine gold, that it is sweeter to you than honey? How do you view God's word? Do you view God as withholding something from you, some goodness, because he tells you to do certain things and tells you not to do certain things? Or do you view his word as gracious and say, there is so much mercy in here. This word is a bomb to my very soul and has set me free. How is it that you view God's word? Let me remind you of if you are in Christ, what you have. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 6, verse 22, but now that you have been set free, and I love this play here, is you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. You notice the play there. You've been set free. You become slaves of God and the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end is eternal life. If we ever, ever for a second doubt how great we have it in Christ, then we have truly forgotten how bad we had it in Adam. God's word is the only inerrant, infallible, and sufficient guide to human flourishing. Period. Do not fall into the trap Eve did. Now, that's Satan's first part of his attack. Let's go to Eve now and look at her mistakes. Verse 2 and 3, And the woman said to the serpent, we, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Eve is ill-prepared to engage with the enemy. And her entire experience with the Creator has been one of blessedness and goodness. Beautiful fellowship, walking with God daily. Blessing is all she has experienced, and as soon as that is called into question, she should have resisted. As James says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. She should have defended God's honor and says, my creator has been a blessing to me. And I need to go to him because I don't know what this is about, a talking serpent. Let me ask you, are you offended when God's character is attacked? Does that offend you? When God's character... His goodness, His grace, the veracity of the truth of the Word of God. Does that offend you when that's attacked? Or do you ponder it and say, well... Well, she also limits the scope of God's blessing. She says, oh, we can have of any tree. That's not what God said. He said, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden. It may not seem like much, but notice how bountiful, generous, and benevolent it was that God said, you can have of everything in this garden, just not this tree. You can surely eat of every tree. It's, a, it's amazing how we do this today. 
God has supplied, I'll just speak for myself, God has supplied me with every need I can imagine as he has promised. In the Sermon on the Mount, do not be anxious about anything, about what you will wear or what you will eat. He has given me eternal life in his son according to his good will. And on top of that, while not being rich, I live a bountiful life. Yet what do we do? What is it that we do? We don't have enough. Never forget how rich you are in Christ. Never neglect or bemoan the blessedness of being in communion with the Savior who took on flesh, who took sin, and then on the cross he bore the wrath of God for you. That you might say, though I die, yet shall I live. Boy, do we have it so great. We have it so great. May we never diminish what we've been given in Christ because we have been given every tree of the garden to eat, so to speak. What do you do? You preach God's blessing in your life found in His Son daily. You preach the gospel to yourself every day. As the gospel song says, count your many blessings, name them by one by one. But friends, if you tried, you couldn't do it and neither could Eve. But how marvelous has God been to you? She limited the reality of what she had in fellowship with God. Other thing she does is she distanced herself from God. Look at how God is introduced in the beginning in verse 1. Lord God, that is the covenant name of God. By the time Satan starts to speak, he uses a general title for God. And Eve does the same thing, distancing herself from her creator. She begins to represent the tree according to its location rather than its significance. It is the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but she goes, it's that tree over there in the midst of the garden. It's like taking what's black and white and making it gray so it doesn't seem so bad when we disobey God's word. Now, I'll admit there are some divine mysteries, there's some tensions in Scripture that this side of heaven we're not going to figure out. But quite honestly, things are pretty plain, aren't they? And the prohibition that God gave them couldn't be any plainer. One of the most dangerous things that she does is she adds to God's word. She says, neither shall you touch it. God didn't say that. Adding to God's word is such a dangerous offense for us today and for Eve at that time. Notice what we read in the book of Revelation, chapter 22. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. Now you may rightly say that only applies to the book of Revelation, those words there, that verse, and I would tend to agree with you. However... This is a common thread throughout all of Scripture. In Deuteronomy twice, in Proverbs, in 1 Corinthians, in Mark chapter 7. Isn't this Jesus' very problem with the Pharisees is that they added to God's Word in an effort to strengthen it, but they actually as a result diminished it? They weakened God's Word? Thinking that their superior knowledge would enforce God's Word. It ignores the creator-creature distinction because it assumes we can approve on what he has given us. It assumes we have a greater depth of insight and knowledge and understanding than God. It positions ourselves really above God because his word is incomplete without our help. That's what Eve is doing here. And I want to just stress this a little harder here. I want you to notice the word touch. Do not touch it typically means more than just like physically touching something. It contains a hint of intimacy with what is being touched. And it's used this way consistently in the Old Testament. So what's my point? Well, most, not most, excuse me, many Hebrew scholars have concluded that it's synonymous with the word eat. So you may think, well, what Eve did wasn't really that bad. No, it was horrible. And that's the subtlety of adding to God's word. Because it, when we add to it, we will add to it in a way that seems to agree with what is already there. You know, the most dangerous doctrines 
in the church are those that most closely resemble what is accepted by Christian orthodoxy? It's barely recognizable. At first glance, it's not always discernible. It seems like a good idea to say don't touch the fruit either. If you don't touch it, you won't eat it. Now, by the way, I understand this passage here. I'm not saying that Eve has intentionally twisted God's word and that she has sinned here. That's not my point. But we do see a progression in Eve, don't we? One of innocence in chapter 2. Now she's beginning to resemble the character and the nature of the serpent in cunning deception. Next thing that we notice is that she does not, or she lessens the severity of punishment. She says, lest you die. That's the same thing as saying, you, you might die if you do this. But God said emphatically, you shall surely die. The consequences for disobedience were disregarded. They were glossed over. They were ignored. God doesn't really mean that is what Eve is saying. People always do this before the fact of sin, don't they? Rarely do they do it after. I'm always shocked that how many people ignore Paul's warning in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 when he says, that is why many of you are weak, ill, and some of you have died. For what? Partaking of the Lord's table in an unworthy manner. We'd be quick to say, well, that was just to the church of Corinth. No, that's God's word for us today. It's amazing how we try to dull the sharp point of the Spirit. People always do this. Satan's target was God, so he attacked his word to get there. This is his tactic. He starts subtly, and he leads Eve to these missteps, and then he outright attacks it. Look at verse 4 and 5. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan categorically calls God a liar here. How? Because he denies the truthfulness of his word. Let me say that again. God is called a liar because Satan denies the truthfulness of his word. Is this book God's word? He actually states that disobedience brings about positive results. Think of the liar who rationalizes a lie because he believes it will result in some sort of positive outcome. Rationalizing sin. Notice the depth of Satan's depravity. He says God knows. Again, this is a beast of the field that should be shocking to us. That a beast of the field would, knows, would, would be able to say that he knows what took place in the inner counsel of the triune God who created him. But he says God knows. I know what God knows. Yet how often do we hear that? When someone's about ready to sin and another person comes along and says, Well, God wants you to be happy, so go ahead and do that. Friends, God doesn't want you to be happy. He wants you to be obedient. But we, we go, well, we, we, we know what God knows. He wants you to be happy. Look what he says. Your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Their eyes were indeed opened, weren't they? Verse 7 confirms that. But what Satan failed to communicate to Eve was that they would see good and evil for the first time only in light of their own wickedness and rebellion against God. Sin never delivers as promised. It never lives up to the hype. It only brings carnage. It only brings death. It only brings destruction. And that's Satan's intent. He says, you'll be like God. This statement implicates God as withholding blessing in order to protect his own status as creator. God's withholding this because he knows you're going to become greater than him or you'll be just like him. Now, not only is he distorting and lying here, Satan is doing that, but at the same time, it seriously does damage to the reality of their situation. You'll be like God, is what Satan says, but they were created in the image of God. They had it so great. They had the breath of life. 
They had only experienced God's goodness and blessing. Eve craves for more out of this new forming disposition that no longer views God in His grace, but as one who withholds blessing. Christian friend, how do you view God? How do you view Him in times of temporal blessing? How do you view Him in times of pain and suffering when things are not going as you thought? Do you view Him as withholding something from you when times are not like what you wanted? Never forget that on the cross, the Father did not withhold one ounce of wrath upon the cross, upon His beloved Son for your sake. He didn't withhold anything for you. It gives you eternal life with Him. Where that image is being recreated that was in the Garden of Eden. You know how we know this? Because His Word tells us don't let it be twisted for you in times of suffering to doubt God's goodness and blessing for you if you are in Christ. Because if you are in Christ, you have the greatest blessing possible. Let his word at that time be a balm to your soul. Eve was restricted by it. And I want you to look at the result in verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. Notice the threefold appeal of sin that she deals with. She saw that the tree was good for food. That is, her bodily senses were attracted by it. She, it says it was a delight to her eyes. That is, the emotions that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, that is an appeal to the intellect, the body, the emotions, the intellect. All three are there. They all appealed to her. So she took of its fruit and ate, since the deal, plunged headfirst into sin, rejecting God's word, rejecting God's way, and to her own peril. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her, who should have grabbed her by the hand and said, let's go back to our merciful father. But because he took an aid of it, through one man, sin entered the world. We are all the progeny of Adam and Eve. You know what's interesting about the story? It doesn't say this here, but you can just assume it. She probably enjoyed the fruit, didn't she? Looked good. Probably took a bite of it, whatever it was. This is good. Sin always feels good in the act. Scripture even acknowledges this. Hebrews 11.25 talks about joy and sin for a season. But one commentator makes this note. As the result of this disobedience of God. He says, but now, after the heart had declined from faith... And from obedience to the word, she corrupted both herself and all her senses, and depravity was diffused through all parts of her soul as well as, as her body. She's completely corrupted. Every aspect of who she is. I'll prove it, verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened as promised, and they knew they were naked. All of a sudden, their minds were flooded with thoughts that had never existed before. All of a sudden, guilt, shame, death, destruction flooded their very souls. Our very senses today are corrupted. Touch, feel, smell, sight, hearing. All of it is. Our whole entire being is. I mean, this is why Paul, quoting from the psalm, says, no one is righteous. No, not one. What, what do we think Jesus meant when Nicodemus came to him at night? And he says, you must be born again. Why? Because your nature is depraved. You need a new one. You need to be born from above. The entirety of the person is afflicted. 
And that is why our very senses that we have and we walk with every day of the flesh betray the reality. The reality that we have this flesh that has been corrupted. And it's corrupted every time we seek our own glory rather than God's. This knowledge and understanding this reality of who we are should make us say, what can I do? Nothing. If you're a Christian, nothing. What do you mean I can't do anything? No, you look at it, it says it right here. What did Jesus say? I am the vine, you are the branches. What did he go on to say? Apart from me, you can do nothing. Christian, if you are in Christ, if we do anything good, it's because we're in Christ and it's been redeemed in Him. But apart from Christ, there is no good that comes from us. Adam and Eve become tragically aware of their own sinfulness. And it says they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths. Instead of running to God and say, be merciful, because you are merciful. They set to cover their own sin as if that was possible. I, I want to close with this thought from A.W. Pink, a theologian of yesteryears. He makes the following point, and I'm paraphrasing. He says, isn't it interesting that the only thing Christ cursed while on earth was a fig tree because it wasn't bearing fruit. Now in the context of that, in Matthew 21, the context of that is that the fig tree was representative of the fruitless religious leaders. But A.W. Pink makes this point, and while the exegesis may not be correct, the point behind it is, Christ cursed the very thing that Adam and Eve used to cover themselves. Christ curses any mode of covering our sin. Any self-effort, any self-righteousness, any self-work to try to cover my sin has been cursed by Christ. Because our sin can only be covered and removed by the blood of Christ. And there is no human method or merit in which we can atone our own sins. It is by Christ alone. And that's according to Scripture alone. Let me just close with this. Did God actually say? Did God actually say? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, what a heavy passage this is. We only begin to scratch the surface of what's here. So much to see and how your goodness has been given to us. How your goodness was there for Adam and Eve. And despite their fall, and despite that we are their progeny, you have provided salvation in your beloved Son, Christ Jesus. And for that we are eternally grateful. And we are thankful that you are a most gracious God to give us a Bible, your word, that reveals to us who you are. May we stand in awe in it and reverence it. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.